namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo saranto suchedoye olahudi sammyao sanputoshe. Namo saranto suchedoye olahudi sammyao sanputoshe. Wushang Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master and Dharma friends, welcome to our Sutra Lecture today. It is Sunday, February 21st here in Australia. Retrograde Mercury is ended its bedevilment of us for another couple months today. Happy to report that. It is Saturday, February 20th in California. You folks have to wait a couple more hours for that official retrograde Mercury to turn direct. And this is another bit of good news along with the landing by NASA of our fifth Mars rover, this one called Perseverance, uh, on a dry uh, river bed, lake bed on Mars. So the other morning I was blessed to be able to watch that live. And I, you know, maybe I'm just a boomer and this kind of thing still excites me, but that's pretty amazing. Uh, the, what we can do when we put our minds to it. Uh, yes, indeed, all the cautions about the problems we have here at home, but uh, if we, we can do both things, it's not a zero sum game, we can both extend our reality testing and, and border pushing and dream realizing in the, in, on the planet, at the same time, we can reflect within and come to new realizations of our connectedness that makes it important for us to ease others' pains uh, in the spiritual realm as well. They're not mutually exclusive, indeed. So uh, thank you all for joining. This is the Flower Garland Sutra. We are going to be looking into the very end of the prose section of the 10 stages, otherwise known as the 10 grounds. The prose section, right? We're about to launch into the verse section. That'll be in another two weeks. We are now doing the polishing on those verses, and we hope, if all goes well, we'll be able to chant them together, as I think they were meant to be chanted, probably, uh, when they were known as the Dakshabhumi section of the Gandavyuha Sutra, entering the Dharma realm. Pre I'm sorry, I said it wrong. The, uh, uh, it's the Dakshabhumi chapter, and it's the, uh, the gatas of the Dakshabhumi, which may well have been um, a separate text at one point, or the first text that then was elaborated into the, to the prose. In any case, it's the story of the Bodhisattva. And we're going to begin our investigation of our section today by invoking spiritual presence. We'll be back to page 78 when the invocation's done. Let's slide up to the top here. Make it nice and big so we can see it. And here we go. Here we are. Cool. That's our melody. All we need to do is apply our minds, and here we go. Namo Dhanfang 
With that, we respect for the request that the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas of the Flower Garland Assembly do attend to our Sutra lecture, bring their blessings and their light, shine on us, to break through the darkness, to heal what is broken, to balance what is out of balance, Bring peace and joy to people's hearts. So we have, let me show you what's left. Look, here's 78, 79, 81, we're done with the prose. We're right there at the end. The, we're talking about the Bodhisattva on the 10th stage, stage of the Dharma cloud and what's unique about him he was just compared to a mani gem, which is one of these, now you see it, now you don't, parts of the Avatamsaka, kind of magical, but just as if you, if you looked quickly enough, you could see it out of the corner of your eye. It's that close to us, but still elusive, right? It's this, uh, it's both a thing, an object, and it's also an analogy. It's also an image of the Buddha's, the Bodhisattva's wisdom at this point. So we finished with that. And now is the summary, right? We have a summary coming up here. What is it? Let's look at that first paragraph. Ready? Here we go. Disciples of the Buddha, only sentient beings who have planted good roots will be able to hear this chapter on the Bodhisattva's gateways to Dharma practices for amassing the meritorious virtue of the wisdom of all modes. That's a mouthful, right? So what's it saying? It says, ordinarily, you wouldn't get to hear about this. The 10th stage is the top of the 10 stages. And at the start, when we began this text, it was so rare, so hard to get to hear that the, the speaker of the text didn't want to speak it. Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva said, nope, you all don't have what it takes. <laughs> you aren't, you know, he said, you, you're not qualified. And it took some multiple convincing by Moon of Liberation Bodhisattva speaking for all those assembled there. <laughs> Then the Buddha himself weighed in and said, yes, they do. Fear not. They're qualified. They can hear it. Go ahead. So with that exhortation, Bajra Treasury launched into it. Now we're at the other end. He's done. And he reiterates, he repeats, he says, only sentient beings who have planted good roots, Zhong Shan Gun, uh, can hear it. Now, let's just stop right there. What are good roots? Um, scholars in their inimitable scholastic way said, oh, good roots. Why not good seeds? Ah. Do we plant good roots? If they're roots, 
They don't need planting. They've already grown, right? No, not in a <coughs> rice culture, a rice growing agronomy. In a world where rice is the staple, you plant roots. Anybody who's ever walked by or actually done the work of planting in a Tao Tian, right? A rice paddy knows that the work involves taking a little rootlet, a little rice seedling, and you plant that down in muddy water. And it's already sprouted and it takes root and it grows, right? Well, we in wheat growing, in potato growing, and potato is not a very really good example, but wheat, soybeans, oats, peas, beans, what do we plant? Seeds, right? We plant seeds. They haven't germinated yet. They haven't put out the sprout. So to hear good roots, it's like, um, you know, what does it mean? So scholars talk about that. The basic staple crop is the way to distinguish east from west. Well, that's okay. Thank you for that scholastic input. But what is the Buddha, ta what is our Bodhisattva talking about when he says sentient beings who planted good roots? Um, this is metaphorical language. He's giving us symbols in concrete reality for something that is invisible in our world. What is he talking about? He's talking about the mind as a field, called the xin di, the mind as earth. And what gets planted down in the field of the mind, the ground, the earth of the mind, is seeds of wisdom, seeds of virtue, seeds of, here is shan, goodness as a thing goodness as a quantity. And I have to say, only after I got to Gold Mountain Monastery personally, did I hear this, did this like rise on the horizon of my awareness. Why? Well, what I knew when I started out doing Zazen, when I was a Zen guy, was I want to get enlightened. I want to get enlightened. And even, you know, such august and respected and excellent teachers as who? Dogen, right? Dao Yuan Chan Shi, Dogen Zenji. Dogen Zenji, who is the revered founder of Soto Zen, which is the, the tradition that I was steeped in in Japan, Dao Yuan Chan Shi, he says what? All you have to do is Zazen, Shikantaza. If you do Zazen, that itself is the Buddha. That's it. That's all you need to do. And of course, I mean, he has multiple, multiple pages of, of intense uh, teaching to back it up. And Dogen Zenji is not a, uh, he doesn't lack any understanding of the Dharma. He is a wonderful teacher. But you have to, dig into his texts, like the Shobo Genzo, Zui Monkey, things like that, to, to uh, the Zheng Fa Yan Zhang, uh, to, to get into the subtleties of it. On the face of it, for people who, for the average Zen sitter, me, for example, all I thought I had to do was sit long enough and magically somehow I was gonna get enlightened, right? Nothing was said about, you have to amass good roots. When I got to Gold Mountain Monastery, here was Master Xuanhua, who was awesome Chan master, not a Zen master, unless you came from the Japanese realm. He was a Chan master. And did he talk about getting enlightened? You, you could hear that. But what did he talk about? He said, Do zuo shan gong de. Do more good deeds. He said, you have to change your bad habits and faults. You have to do more good deeds. 
You have to look into the source of your mind and find the goodness. And it's like, I don't know if I want to do that. I just want to get enlightened, you know. And here was the path to getting enlightened based on a millennium old analysis of human nature, which was the Buddha Dharma. And it was like, boy, that sounds hard. That's hard. Why do I good? Why do I have to be good? Can I just be myself? Here is the master urging us to, in every possible way, increase the goodness of our behavior. Look at yourself. Look inside. Don't seek outside for some mysterious enlightenment. It sounds kind of suspiciously like something that you order online. Could I get a six pack of enlightenment? I'd like a big one. Is it on sale? Uh, can I return it if I'm not happy? You know? So I was raised to be a consumer. I had no idea that it had, that the real teachings of the Buddha had anything to do with planting good roots, but that we heard about roots, not seeds, translated as seeds. Say plant good seeds, it doesn't matter. Disciples of the Buddha, only sentient beings who have planted good seeds will be able to hear this chapter. Fine. If you want to make it wheat seeds, if you want to make it, you know, soybean, barley, go for it. Sorghum, fine. Doesn't matter. But pay attention to the good part. That was what I didn't get out of my Zen background. And mind you, my approach to Zen was pretty shallow. And if I'd stuck around long enough to listen to Uchiyama Roshi, he, I'm sure, would have steered us towards goodness because he had this transmission from the Soto school. But from my shallow approach, I didn't understand that the path to Buddhahood arises from my own behavior, from me as a person. The first step, if I actually want to set foot on the path and carry it down the road, was to attend to who I was in my relationships with my friends, with my family, with my colleagues, with my enemies, with myself. How did I live? And even more precise, let's look at the words I speak. Oh, oops. <laughs> when did I stop my four letter words, for example? When did I decide that I was going to clean up my speech? Huh? Big question, right? How about my relationship with the thoughts in my mind? Was my mind a no-fly zone? Did I forget to pay attention to the thoughts in my mind? If so, that's my good roots are going to be not only shallow, but they're going to be dry, thirsty for, for water, for nourishing, for nurturing, right? And then what about the deeds that I do with my body? I had no idea when I got to Gold Mountain that I would suddenly be paying attention to my body, my mouth, and my mind. And in fact, that indeed was the fastest path to enlightenment. Although Master Hua's version of it that he wanted us to pay attention to, I was still slow to pick up, which was the Bodhi resolve, this wish to wake up, that that was uh, available to me and I needed to go into my mind and plant down that good root, good seed. It's said to be the finest of all good things is this wish to wake up, this resolve to truly wake up on behalf of living beings. So those are good roots, right? Avoiding evil is a good root. And, uh, if you look at, there's a Shastra called the Shastra of the Hundred Dharmas of the Sarvastivadin School by Faming Manlun. It's a Shastra that talks about good deeds, particularly. There are 11 that it specifies. And of those 11, multiple, multiple numbers of them are avoiding things. Avoiding greed is a good thing. Avoiding anger is a good thing. Avoiding delusion and stupidity is good all by itself. So that appealed to me finally when I recognized what was going on here was this was a path 
This was not just a wish. It wasn't just another kind of greed to stack on top of my other less, <laughs> less wholesome greed and greedy desires, right? I want to get enlightened. It must be good. I'll, I'll kill to get enlightened. Yeah, get out of my way. I'm, I'm getting enlightened, right? So it's good. So I can be greedy as much as, nah, still greed, right? And when I finally saw, wow, here is a path. Here is something that you can do should you choose to walk it and get your act in gear. Move your feet down the road. This will take you there, right? And at first it seemed like so much work and what's like, I only want to get enlightened, get out of my face, right? Uh -uh. You got to get into your face if you really want to do what the Buddha did. So those are good roots. And for anybody who wants more than platitudes, for anybody who wants more than cliches and good religious words, here's a path. You can walk it. It's, thank you very much. Buddha, thank you, Shurfu, for finally explaining what good seeds are and how they can, by planting them, I can actually grow my own, grow a garden on that shindi, on that mind ground, a garden that I want to spend time in, a clean, well-lit, wholesome place for growing wholesome things, right? So there's that first phrase. It's only sentient beings who've done that can what? Hear this sutra. You don't get to hear the Avatamsaka Sutra if you haven't got those affinities, those conditions, uh, those good, good qualities, right? Or you'll hear it and you'll think, uh, not for me. Yeah, so that's a little bit self-selecting, but fair, fair. Uh, I remember uh, the first time, speaking of which, mm, embarrassing, uh, my former college roommate, David Bernstein, David, if you're here, call home, right? I'd love to talk to David. I don't know where he is. He became Bhikshu Hung Yo, got to Gold Mountain Monastery before I did, and started mailing me Vajra Bodhi Seat, the journal of the Dharma Realm Buddhist Association. At the time, it was the Sino-American. It was Saba, Zhong Mei Fo Jiao Zhong Hui, before it became the Fa Jie Fo Jiao Zhong Hui. He sent me Vajra Bodhisi, and it came in an envelope. Clearly, it was homemade. It was a small journal, monthly. And I pulled it out of the envelope and opened it up. And here were these American guys, Jewish guys, wearing robes. So their heads shaved, wearing a precept sash. And I looked at them, and I went, huh, phonies. I took it and threw it, <laughs> threw it on my, across the bed onto my table had the Lotus Sutra in it, and I'm chucking it across the room. Bang, you know. I think back, ooh, probably not a good thing to do. But I, I, they're phonies. Look at those pretenders, right? Where was, where was I at the time? Uh, I was deeply into my Berkeley commune lifestyle. And I was not planting good roots, good seeds. If anything, I was planting bad seeds, good, bad roots. So I couldn't see it. I had it in my hand. I had the, the journal of the proper dharma in America in my hands, and I didn't see it. I chucked it across the table. Ah, ami tofu, right? So I couldn't hear it back then. Luckily now, I have, I've been cleaning my, planting my garden, trying to weed it and keep it growing. So I can hear the chapter on what? The Bodhisattva's gateways to Dharma practices for amassing the meritorious virtue of the wisdom of all modes. <sighs> yes, indeed. That's a title. Uh, so let's unpack it. The wisdom of all modes is a degree of wisdom comes out of your mind. Same, same place to look. It's just a name for the each Zhong Zhi, it's called the wisdom of all modes. That's the Buddha's wisdom. The meritorious virtue, meaning the power, the functioning. The gong de here, it's not passive. If you have gong de, it's alive. It's like you take your nature and you plug it in and the lights come on. There you go. 
uh, I remember asking Shervo, 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 you tell us that Master Empty Cloud, Master Shulao had real merit and virtue. What does it mean, Shervo? And Shervo said, it was a kind of light, he said. And it's the kind of light that we, if you read the, the biography of, actually it's the autobiography of Master Empty Cloud, uh, it's called his chronology, right? It's very sparse. He did not wax eloquent about his life. He, just a couple words. But if you read in there, uh, Master Hua, our, our teacher, actually took Master Empty Cloud's biography, autobiography, and hired an illustrator in Hong Kong, found a good pen and ink, wood, woodblock pen and ink, uh, pen and ink, I guess, illustrator, picked out chapters from that biography and illustrated them with a verse. He wrote uh, actually two verses, uh, a verse and then a following verse. Uh, he, uh, I need to say it correctly. It was a prose essay and then a verse following it. And it became Xu Yin Lao Shang Hua Zhuan, his illustrated biography. And the light that came out of Master Empty Cloud's meritorious virtue, his gongda, did such things as coming down the road during very turbulent civil war times and having a soldier uh, see him and take his rifle and point it right at Master Empty Cloud and draw a bead on him and where are you going? Say one word and you're a dead monk. You know, Master Empty Cloud said, uh, that's fine, kill me. Uh, I don't think you will because you and I don't have any negative affinities, but it's to my time to go, I'll certainly go. No worries. And I don't blame you, you know. And this guy's, who is this? You know, puts his rifle down and wants to talk to him and find out uh, how, how he can be enlightened by this teacher. So that kind of fearlessness comes from having looked deeply into your mind and cultivated meritorious virtue. And it, the light that comes from that kind of courage and fearlessness can subdue uh, a uh, armed militant, right? Subdue a soldier who's out to use his gun to kill. So yeah, uh, other times Master Empty Cloud was on a bus in Sichuan uh, when robbers jumped on board and they stole everything of value from all the seats in front. They got to the back of the bus where the, where the old monk was sitting and they saw him and knelt down on the bus and broke into tears and said, please don't blame us worthy sir, venerable one, we're starving. We can't feed our children. This is the only way we know to, to get through the days. We're so sorry. And Master Empty Cloud said, he opened his eyes and said, don't worry. He said, I'll return the stuff. I'll be sure to get some food for you. So he accompanied them and managed to, to get some offerings shared with the, the robbers. But they did it. They gave back the... <laughs> The, the goods they stole, the watches and the rings from the people on the bus. And, and uh, it was entirely the light coming from this old skinny monk that changed the turn disaster into a teaching moment, right? That's gunda, all right? So it comes from the heart, but you cultivate it. It's innate, it's inherent, but you polish it out. You uncover it. So wisdom of all modes, meritorious virtue, amassing Dharma practices that create that uh, rubbing, polishing, stain removing, uh, you know, unfocused, turning to focused, Vaseline removing from the lens Dharma practices that are what? Bodhisattva's gateways to Dharma practices that amass the merit and virtue of the wisdom. All right, that's this chapter. Thank you, Vajra Treasury, for encapsulating, encapsulating.
putting a circle around what we've been looking at. We've been looking at a chapter that teaches us how bodhisattvas approach the practices that remove the covers of these, the virtue that leads to the Buddha's wisdom. Yep. Having said that, what you got? Jetoya Pusa Yam, one Su Faman, Do Ji Hoof, Do Ji So Fu, Jin Gang Zang Pusa Yam, Ru Yi Che Ji, So Ji Fu De, one Su Faman, Fu De Ru Shi. Moon of Liberation asks, How many blessings does one gather from hearing of these gateways to the Dharma? Vajra Treasury replied, the blessings and virtue amassed from hearing these gateways to the Dharma are just like the blessings and virtues gathered from omniscience. Uh, we're going to continue. Sorry, we're, one more little. We'll go down to the bottom here. Fei bu wen si gong de fa man er nang xin jie shou chi du song he kuang jing jin ru shuo xiu xing shi gu dang zhi yao de wen si why is this? One must hear of these Dharma gateways for merit and virtue in order to believe and understand, receive, hold, read, and recite them. How much the more is it the case for one who vigorously practices according to their teachings? Therefore, know that you must first hear of these Dharma gateways for amassing the merit and virtue of omniscience in order to be able to believe, understand, receive, hold, and practice according to them, and afterwards arrive at the stage of omniscience. Thank you, Vajra Treasury. So you've told us that if you don't get to hear them, there's no, no deal, right? You can't accept them cultivate according to them, realize them, right? Well, if that's true, why did you not lecture? Why did you not explain them at the start? Sir, <laughs> we have to hear them, right? Well, that's why you were holding them back. Mm. Sounds like a Senate majority leader we know who tells us that we can't. There, I no, won't do that. Nope, 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 nope. Go. So, Clearly, Vajra Treasury knows what he's doing. It's not that he doesn't know what he's doing. Question. Moon Liberation says, okay, here we are. We're in the assembly. We've been here. We, we, we're wearing the t-shirt. We ate the popcorn. How much blessings did we get from sitting in to this lecture that you just gave us on the 10 stages? What did we get? from that in terms of food, blessings and virtue, right? Good question. Is he asking for himself? No, he knows. He's asking for everybody else. What was the good stuff that came to us from hearing about the 10 stages from one to 10? Vajra Treasury replies, the blessings and virtues that you got from hearing about these fa'aman, gateways to the Dharma. In the past, we would have translated it as Dharma doors, right? Gateways to the Dharma, that's a Dharma door, fa'aman. So by hearing about how bodhisattvas cultivate the 10 stages, you got blessings and virtue like hearing, like attaining Buddhahood gathered from omniscience. What did he say? He said, one sufaman fuda ru, see here. She said, ji ji da da ru yi che ji so ji fuda. Like, he says, it's just like the fuda, the blessings and the virtue that you got from yi che ji, omniscience. Okay. So if you have omniscience, basically you have the Buddha's wisdom that much blessings and virtue. Okay, let's stop there for a second. We can look at our golden wallaby.
who's chewing on a Singapore daisy. He's got the blessings of abundant greenery and a peaceful environment. Nobody's bugging him. Nobody's giving him trouble. He can eat, eat his fill of Singapore daisy, and we wish he'd actually eat more. So um, what are we talking about? Blessings and virtue. Um, here's another, this is another one of those. Uh, I talked about Shangun, right? Coming to Gold Mountain Monastery and plunging into what's called Zhengfa, right? The right Dharma. When, what I, when I was, my, my gateway into the Dharma was books at first. I, I think the very first time I heard anything related to Buddhism probably came from my, bless his heart, my father's bedside reading table. I had this bad habit of disobeying my dad. My dad was not happy when I would mess with his stuff, finger his possessions. But of course, as a kid, I just, anything that my dad liked, I wanted to like, I wanted to know about. And he had a bedside reading table and he didn't like me messing with his books because he'd come home at night, fatigued from a day of work, wanted to pick up a book and read himself to sleep. So here I come in the daytime, anything my dad was reading, I would take it. If I didn't keep the very same bookmark in the same page, my dad would pick it up. Who's been messing with my book? Well, not me, dad. So I would read during the day what my dad was reading at night. And he had a copy of Jack Kerouac's The Dharma Bones. He was reading Jack Kerouac. My dad was a contemporary reader and a he was interested in what was popular and he read all of Ian Fleming, James Bond and read all of the Louis L'Amour Westerns, Hondo and, and uh, what are the other ones, Rawhide and, and he would read John D. McDonald, Travis McGee Mysteries and I was reading right along behind him. My dad also read biography. He read Winston Churchill's biography, I remember in Battle of Britain and, and uh, so there was the Dharma Bones, the Jack Kerouac. And I picked it up and there on the cover was the title Dharma. First, first word, Dharma, you know. And you open it up and he's talking about what? The Diamond Sutra. Ah, the Diamond Sutra. And the word Buddha and the word Prajna was all there. You know, it's like, gee whiz. I remember having those words echo in my mind because they were not English, but there was something about them. There was a flavor, a resonance to them. It was a sound, right? It was a, and a, and a. It's like, what's that, right? I, I'm, for some reason, I remember being in my junior high school art class with my classmates, and I was writing Dharma, D-H-A-R-M-A. The D-H was not a, an English consonant cluster. I really like the Dharma. So that was the first time it was from books. And then I ran into the Six Patriarch Sutra in my library, bilingual Chinese English. And oh, there was an actual Buddha Sutra. 14 years old, I was holding the words of uh, Liu Zhu Hui Nang Da Shi, translated by Seton Hall University. And that was, I wanted it. I wanted, I felt I belonged to that tribe. I didn't belong to the tribe of Sunday school gospel stories, right? So uh, that was my, you could say, I first encountered that gateway to the Dharma, right? I heard of Dharma gateways for merit and virtue, and it took me a long time to, uh, as our text says, Believe in, understand, receive, hold, read, and recite anything about that. 
That led me to books by Alan Watts, The Way of Zen. Um, I was happy to read the um, Zen Flesh, Zen Bones, Paul Rep's collection of little stories, right? The Swiss author. Um, I read uh, Philip Kaplow's The Three Pillars of Zen. And that was where I heard the words Satori and Kensho and Nirvana, you know, I, and I knew that there was more and more there. But I hadn't, it took me until I got to Gold Mountain Monastery before these important words came alive for me. And the words that are still resonating for me today are words such as merit, gong, virtue, the blessings, fu, wisdom, hui, never mind, kindness, si, compassion, a, and then deeper words such as emptiness, kong, right, and bodhi, pu ti, these are another deeper level of understanding what we cultivate for. Why bother being a Buddhist? And then the word that we found earlier today, shan gun, wholesome qualities, roots of goodness. We translate that more often now as wholesome qualities, goodness in your own nature. That's what we're cultivating for, not only enlightenment, right? Um, Philip Kaplow, bless his heart, the uh, uh, founder of the Rochester Zen Center and a well-respected, uh, excellent writer and teacher. Of, he committed himself to a life of Zen. He uh, was educated in the same Zen tradition that I encountered, although he was Rinzai more than than uh, Soto. And the words that he understood were, among others, Kensho, awakening, right? And Satori, another kind of awakening. The path to get there was Zazen, and also investigating Wato, the, this kind of struggling with mental concepts. And it was very much a left brain, and I have to say, and external, it was still externalized. If the Roshi was skillful, he could give you the right question. You'd chew on your, your, your koan until oh, magically something happened and you woke up. It was still an external event. The actual causes of awakening, the work that one did on the mind ground was not clear to me until I got to Gold Mountain. And here is Master Hua saying, you have to amass wholesome qualities, merit, virtue, skillfully cultivate blessings. And then Master Hua would take it even deeper. He would say, Qin Shou Jie Xi Mie Tan Chen Chi. Diligently cultivate precepts, meaning character, concentration, samadhi, or focus, and then wisdom emerges. Put to rest greed, anger, and stupidity. Finally, there was a map. And the map said, watch out, because you will stumble if you diligently cultivate greed, anger, and stupidity. Put to rest precepts, concentration, and wisdom. You can go wrong in the mind. It's all there to go wrong with. So you have to cultivate just the way you could say your garden can happily grow weeds and thistles and thorns, star thistle, right? You can grow crabgrass in the garden of your mind if you don't weed it and it'll grow all by itself. It's there too. So finally, when I got to Gold Mountain, here were the instructions I was looking for. This was the explanation, right? So how refreshing and sobering and maturing. That's the other thing I want to say. This is not for kids. This explanation of the Dharma 
is for rational adults, let's say, to do with your chronological age. It has to do with your willingness to take charge of your body, your mouth, and your mind. And following the map, following the instructions of the governor, mixing my metaphors left and right here, get in there and choose the crops you want to grow, apply the method and grow them. They will. They'll grow in the mind. That's what the Dharma is for. But listen, he says, the blessings and virtues, the fu and the du, those two goals of cultivation that you amass by what? By hearing the gateway to the Dharma, the blessings and virtues that you gather when wisdom is a way of nature, because that's the tenth stage. You have to hear those Dharma gateways for merit and virtue in order to what? Sickly, I heard it, but I don't believe it. Oh, well, now I believe it, but I don't understand it. I kind of have a, a dull belief, a, a blind belief. Oh, now I actually hear it. I believe it. I've seen it work, so I understand it. Now I can show. Sure, I can actually hold it. Those, the, the show sure is to like take it in your hands. Or I can, I know where to go to find it, to read it, and then to recite it. And furthermore, if I want that blessings and virtue, I can vigorously practice according to what it says. Okay. Now, if we had a, a line, like a, you know, a, a graph here, um, the COVID-19 infection graphs in your newspaper, I can't make myself do it. I skip right over them, showing how many infections, how many deaths per country per month, you know, per state per, nah, I don't read them, anyway, but they're there. And if we had a graph of press on the way, right, towards each edge, towards omniscience, towards the wisdom of the wisdom of all modes, right? And this would be zero, not interested, not hearing it, and the accomplishment, your nature and the Tao become one. That was fully alight. Then, all righty, I just got to notice that my internet is unstable. <laughs> no, it's not. No, no, no. Uh, then, along that pathway, what would we see? We would see planting good roots, good seeds, blessings growing. Then what? Hearing about these practices. Then, oh, believing in them, understanding them, receiving them, holding them, reading them, reciting them, and then doing what they say, stepping into the practices. So we say living in to those practices as they are taught. And each one of those steps along the path, you can see there's a pushback, right? Oh man, this is success in a, in a timeline. This is the path. This is what the Bodhisattva does. Is he, right? What does he do? He do? He ting wen, and after he ting wen, ta jiu xin jie. And after xin jie, there is shou chi. After shou chi, there is du song. Finally, there is Rufa Xiuxing, right? So there's all these stages all the way. Believe and you understand. You hear them, you have to believe them, understand them, you have to receive them and hold them. You can read and recite them, but that's still not living into them. That's still not putting them into practice. Gradual stages of commitment. And another thing to point out here nowhere in this description. Is there any judgment? Nowhere is the Buddha or Vajra treasury or moon of liberation scowling at you and saying, huh, you stopped at reading and reciting. You did not vigorously put them into practice. The teachers were still in the book. As soon as you closed the sutra book, you went off your merry way and, you know, behaved following your own bad habits and faults. Looking right at a mirror. <laughs> That's me. Right? Ten years as a monk, and Master Hua says, How long 
have you been a monk? I don't think you've taken the first step inside the Buddha's door, he said. I think you still think that the Buddha is a cop who's going to bust you if he catches you breaking the precepts. Am I right? And I'm all right. So on my timeline of moving towards the 10th stage, I had not vigorously practiced according to the teachings. It was still outside. I was still following precepts because I thought I should. Because my teacher might bust me or might withhold the good stuff if he caught me breaking them. My heart wasn't into it, right? I was still being a rebellious kid, being a hippie, wanting to have, you know, have it my way. You can't tell me what to do. Don't fence me in. Let me ride through the skies. Do, 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 do. Don't fence me in. The cowboy who's going to look out for the country, right? If he doesn't happen to like the sheriff. Okay, that's a story. That's a beloved story of confusion, alienation, and uh, suffering. Okay. Take a break. My voice can get very tiresome after a while. Take a look here. Oh, yeah, from last night. How do you like baby on board? You know those family station wagons that has a sticker on the bumper, baby on board? Mom is the SUV. This is Mother Possum. This is Polly, and she was a baby just last year. She is now full-grown mom and baby. We don't have a name. We need a name for the new baby. What should we call it? Any suggestions for the new baby name? She's clinging tight. Poor mom. Pretty soon mom's fur is going to be because those are sharp baby claws clinging this out right there. <laughs> She's clinging on tight because she is just a nub. She's a bubba. Here's mom chewing on pears and let's see, what else is here? Apples, apples and pears. That's mom, that's one. And shifting out the tree branches, we got another family. This is mother kookaburra, two babies. Notice they're brown, brown is white here. They are brown. He's, he's <laughs> turning his head around 180 degrees, right? But they will, this turns white underneath soon. Notice mom's beak is yellow under these two babies. Although they're physically as big, he's still black underneath. And this, their chest feathers are brown. These will whiten up and that will turn yellow. Mom has been such a good mom. Hello there. These are laughing kookaburras. Yeah, yeah. Let's see what else have we got? Oh, we have some flower photos from last week too. Check this one out. This is called in Australia, it's called Queen of the Night. It's the night blooming Sirius. The Chinese call it Tanhua. Tanhua Yixian. The Tang appears only one time. Truly so. We, uh, we found this orphan plant over on our Arhat Trail. And uh, Alex and I grabbed it and brought it back to Paramita House, planted it down. And it produced three of these in one night. And they, they're these funny uh, pod-shaped blooms they're really tightly held. And then there's one night when at sunset, they do this. At midnight, they're like this. And the next morning, they're doop, over, right? They appear for one night. They're very fragrant. The bugs love them. And the pollen is transmitted at night. But that's it. The next morning, over, right? Tanhua, Tanhua Yixing, called night blooming serious flowers. We have them in Berkeley as well. 
same flower. And then, because our, our boss here at Dharmaster Jin Fu, our senior nun, really likes lotuses, and we found a, uh, I believe he's a Taiwanese, uh, Australian, who is raising some superior lotus, lotus tubers. There's, again, they're funny plants. They, they grow in the water, like kind of like potatoes. And when they bloom, we've got some right outside the door where I'm now. When they bloom, they look like that. Ooh. Spectacular. Look at that. That was after a steady rain. We've got white ones, yellow ones, uh, white ones tipped with, with fuchsia, and these pink and red, beautiful, real lotuses. So, all righty, there we go. We're okay, checking the time here. Good. Um, let's look back at our bodhisattvas talking about blessings. Boy, oh boy. So, the blessings from hearing of the 10th ground are like the blessings you get when you're a Buddha. Why? His answer is an interesting answer. Why is that? Why are they the same? He says, you have to hear about them to believe and understand them. And you have to believe and understand them to receive and hold them. You have to receive and hold them before you can read and recite them. And then once you read and recite them, you can choose to step into them and make them your lifestyle. Put them on like shoes, right? He says, okay, therefore, he says, Shigu, you should know that if you, you have to first hear of them for amassing the merit and virtue of omniscience, in order to be able to believe, understand, receive, hold, practice according to them, and afterwards get to Buddhahood. Okay. Now, the importance here is on what? Hearing the sutras. You got to hear the sutras. How important is that? And I'm going to go back again to my personal experience, I had my first encounter with a Buddhist Sutra happened at age 14 at my local public library. Man, oh man, how important are public libraries? This was the Sigmund Sanger branch of the Toledo Public Library. It was about a 20 minute walk from my house, about a mile. And I wore out the sidewalk back and forth between my house and the library. I was a reader. I, my library card was a big deal for me. It was my passport to the world, not only the physical world, but of the mind and the imagination. Oh, I read all around the world. And among the books I read, one of the most exciting was the Asian religion shelf which had a half a dozen books total. And The Prophet by Khalil Gibran and The Tao Te Ching to Lao Tzu by, Lao, by Lao Tzu. Bilingual, Chinese English, facing pages. And then The Six Patriarchs Sutra. And then through Jack Kerouac, hallelujah, Jack Kerouac wrote about the Diamond Sutra and the Heart Sutra, the Lotus Sutra. This time I'd heard those names and it awoke something. There's no doubt in my mind that it woke something up. And interestingly enough, when I finally was able to break through my own confusion and the grip that my ego had on my conscious mind, I took myself to Gold Mountain Monastery. And there over the door of Gold Mountain Monastery were three, three words, ah, yen, hoi, flower, garland, assembly. We just did what? Namo da fang guang fo hua yan jing hua yan hai hui fo pu sa. We added the word hai ocean wide, the ocean wide from a flower assembly. 
the Avatamsaka assembly. What's that? Master Hua had begun to explain the Flower Garland Sutra, the, the text that took him nine years to finish. I got there just as he was wrapping up what's called the Shrentan, Master Chongguan's uh, commentary that he explained first as a gateway to go into the Flower Garland Sutra. Nine years later, he finished. I didn't, I wasn't there for the very first couple months, but I came across the bay for the first time, feeling now as I look back on it, as if I were of iron filing being drawn to a magnet, right? Like that. You put a magnet down with a bunch of nails, the nails go right to the magnet. Felt like something pulled me across the bay to Gold Mountain Monastery. Otherwise, I was supposed to be a professor, probably. I was going to be Professor Lancaster's student. And uh, I had an opportunity to be Dr. Konz's student. And Sanskrit was not my door, Chinese was. But I, I could have followed Professor Lancaster. I was on my way. I was pulled out of an academic career by something. Clearly it was the presence now in hindsight. Clearly it was the presence of Gold Mountain Monastery, Master Shrin Hua's being there and his explaining the Avatamsaka Sutra, like a nail to a magnet, <clears throat> pulled me over. If you had said to me, oh, you know what? There's a book that's going to claim your life. I would have said, what are you drinking? What are you smoking? Mm -hmm. Nonsense. In fact, as I think about it, it was only three years later that I took a copy of that book, put it on my back, and silently recite, uh, out loud recited the name of it hundreds of times, a million, millions of times in all for two and a half years and then continued even after reaching the destination of my pilgrimage. How strange is that, right? Every three steps, bowing to the ground and reciting the name of the sutra. From one perspective, that's pretty crazy behavior. People wonder what was I smoking, including my mother. And yet, that made perfect sense. At the and since then, I have part of every day, part of it, I spend uh, opening the text and read it in another language and sharing it. Right? So, right? Of course, I'm, I'm not an ordinary meditating Buddhist monk. I, early on, took my path towards what was called the teaching school, the Jiaozong, to become an, uh, someone who does midrash in the Jewish sense, someone who does uh, exegesis in the Catholic sense. I comment on text, and I put my life next to that sutra. Um, I had no idea. I thought I was going to be a meditator seeking enlightenment. Mm. There's much more. So let's step back away from my. Where would we be if Master Hua had not insisted that part of every day, 90 minutes of every day, is going to be spent letting the Buddha's voice be heard? Let me clarify. I didn't know this until I went to Asia. When you go to Asia, sutras are not popular. There is always a few people who occasionally open texts, but what do you do with sutras? You recite them. You do song, just like the sutra says, you read and recite them. You don't explain them. You don't take the words as words. You take them as sacred objects. You chant them. Good, nothing wrong with that. That's a, definitely a, a way to get rid of false thinking, to do what the Buddha said, to your self 
You spend time putting the Buddha's wisdom through your ears and out your mouth, through your eyes and out your mouth. But there's another level of engagement that Master Hua did, which was, okay, he said, let's see what this means. He would explain a line and then he would tell a story about it. He would illustrate it. And then when he was done, we, did, we thought this is the way everybody explains sutras. He would say, he would say, anybody got any questions? If you don't have any questions, I'm going to ask you, so you better ask me. And he meant it. People would say, oh, sure, I didn't understand. He would say, oh, well, thanks. For the, here's what it is. This is what it means. What do you think it means? He would say. You know, he was trying every method to get us to engage the texts. We didn't know that that was rare. We thought everybody did it that way. You know what we found? Interesting obstacles in the 20th century, where we first started this, to explaining sutras. Obstacles. True blocks to explaining the sutras. Like what? Well, how about the one that says, Hmm. Right? Explaining sutras? You explain a single word wrong, you can fall into the hells. Who's going to do that? What? The Buddha laid traps, like booby traps, for people who were careless and explained the sutras wrong? Who's going to dare to do that if it's danger in the sutras? Like, that's nonsense. But we, this is truly, truly out there. People laugh when I say that because they've heard it. So who's going to dare explain a sutra? Number two, people say, hmm, Right? Okay. Oh, I don't explain sutras. My wisdom isn't enough. I look at the commentaries. I go to Master Fazang in the Hua Yanjing, or I go to Jomaro Shi Fasher or the Vajras, which is what? Perfectly fine. Those commentaries, like I said, are superb. They're profound, and nobody so far in the West has cracked them very much. Very, very, there's this whole treasury of Shastras. The learned wisdom of followed the Buddha and nuns who followed the Buddha. The problem is, those are not the Buddha's words. They're the words of awakened monks and nuns. The Buddha's voice is different. And Master Hua said, we want the Buddha's voice to be heard. You need to open the sutras every single day if you want to understand how to be a better person. The, the, the words of the sutras are like a mirror. They show you your true face. The words of the Buddha are like a blueprint. From this blueprint, you can build the house of your life and that of your family and your nation, he said. The words of the Buddha are like a map. If you follow them, you will find your way back home. You can't go a single day without input from the Buddha's voice. He said, anybody have any questions? He would say, right? So did he ignore the, the commentaries? No, he didn't. He explained the Huayanjing nega Tan Xuan, nega nega Xuan Tan, Huayan Xuan Tan, Master Chengguan's commentary to the Alatamsaka preface, the suspended commentary. He explained that first, and then he would open up the Tang Dynasty commentary. But then he put them aside, and when it came time to explain, he would lecture from whoever was sitting in the audience that night. He would be explaining, and he would see me nodding off, and he would say, oh, look at Guajun here. Guajun is uh, looking deep, deeply into sleeping samadhi, he would say. Another kind of samadhi. Right, Guajun? I'm not embarrassed, and I would... Like myself, you know, yeah, sure. Boy. And he would, he would find a way, anyway, to engage us in the text of the sutra, and brought them to life, brought the sutras to life, and 
like he all of the things around the explaining of the sutra things like requesting dharma that we do and he would say you all can't see it you all can't see it but you know what he said every time you ching fa you are in invoking samantabhadra bodhisattva's ching dran seven requesting uh, the bow number six, requesting the Buddhas speak the Dharma. Ching Po Ju Shi, you're also doing number seven, asking the Buddhas to stay in the world. He said, this is right. You know when you do that, according to Dharma, they come. He said, the three jewels, the triple jewel, the 10 directions and the three periods of time, you can't see them? He would say, they're here, look, all around. All the Dharma protectors, the gods, the dragons, the Kinaras, Garudas, Maharagas, they're all here, the Akshas, Right? The Kalavinkas, they all come because they want to hear the sutra too. You think this is just a game we're playing? No. You would, you would talk like that and we're like, oh, uh, uh, yeah, sure, Do you see him? Then he would, he would guarantee us they were here. And then sometimes he would say, oh, Sudhana has just climbed on my Dharma seat. <laughs> He's here beside me. Shansai Tong is a gong gong pada, what a fazo shan. And we're going, wait a minute. And he would say, oh, Sun Wukong, oh, Tiao Pi. Sun Wukong Zhou, the Kong, the Ting Pa. He would say, you know, monkey from the three, from the, the uh, uh, Shio Ji has, is now near the sutra tonight. He's messing around here in empty space. He's very mischievous. We go, but sure food, Sun Wukong is, in a, is a novel. And he'd say, what do you know? <laughs> you know, certainly from someone who has that kind of vision going on, explaining sutras is a profound spiritual experience. It's alive, empty every dust mote is alive with spiritual presence. When you take the Buddha's wisdom, which comes from where? From inside. It's not a book, it's the nature awakened someone who has done what has skillfully amassed the blessings and the virtue of cultivating the bodhisattva's gateways to each ajur to omniscience who has heard them first of all the sutras are here because a teacher made it important to keep them here and translate them because of shurfu's insistence so we too now can hear them, having heard them, we can believe and understand them. We can hold them, hang on to them. We can read and recite them and then actually put them into practice. Thank you, Sherfu, for insisting that we do that. Right? All right. Um, another thing about blessings uh, blessings I once asked I said to Sherful, Sherful, what are blessings how do you cultivate blessing I expected something I didn't know what to expect Sherful said Ling taren huan shi, shou you fu. he said make other people happy they'll have blessings about simple, but implicit in not making yourself happy. There's a sutra called the Mangala Sutta from the uh, Pali tradition, which is the Sutra of the Highest Blessings. And talked about good roots, good seeds. Those are blessings. How do you get them? This entire Sutra is based on that. It's a long list. There are 10 verses of specific acts, but I thought it was, it'd be good to hear it from Buddha. 
It includes listeners, interestingly. But take a look and compare. How are you going to spend the rest of your weekend? If you live in Texas, you're going to spend the rest of your weekend trying to warm up. Probably finding a way to boil water if you can get water. Texas was hit by a catastrophic weather event that they were not prepared for. And people lost light, they lost power and heat, they lost water. Uh, so we can transfer the blessings to uh, our friends in Texas, of which we have many. But blessings go on like a bank account. You invest them, you spend them, you invest more. I have heard at one time the exalted one staying at a town of abundant blessings in the grove in a not a pindicus park now the night was late Devo drew near, shedding light that lit up the entire Jada Grove. She found the Buddha, she walked up, paid her respects, and stood to one side. From there, she sang these words. To the exalted one, the gods and humans wanting to live right think about blessings. Please tell us what are the greatest blessings. Now, you all are going to hear me ten times go, These are the greatest blessings. These are the greatest blessings. Welcome to join in when we get there. You'll, you'll know where. These are the greatest blessings. These are the greatest blessings. Here we go. The Buddha said, Stay away from fools. Make friends with the wise. Honor people who are worthy of honor. Here we go. These are the greatest blessings. These are the greatest blessings. Live in a suitable place. Own your merit from the past. Set your feet to walk a straight road. Ready? These are the greatest blessings. These are the greatest blessings. To be learning, to be good with your hands, to learn discipline and speak skillfully. Ready? These are the greatest blessings. These are the greatest blessings. To support your mother and father, cherish your spouse and children, to work a peaceful occupation. Ready? These are Greatest blessing. These are greatest blessing. To be generous in giving, to be righteous in action, to help your relatives and be blameless. In your deeds, here we go. These are the greatest blessings. 
Dharma when you can. Here you go. These are the greatest blessing. These are the greatest blessing. To be patient and obedient, to associate with monks, thank you, and to join religious discussions when you can. How about that? Self-restraint, a pure and modest life, the perception of the noble truths. Look at this one. And to realize nirvana. From sorrow, from, from defilements and liberated from all fears, these are the greatest blessings, these are the greatest blessings, people Live their lives on principle, always come out on top. Their happiness is assured. These are the greatest blessings. These are the greatest blessings. Be nice to get those lines evened out. They're all each of different length, and that's why you kind of have to walk your way through it. But there you go. So all the way from stay away from fools to be liberated from fear. If you live your life on principle, you always come out on top. You're going to be happy. These are the greatest blessings. So that's the Mahamangala Sutta. Yes, indeed. Okay, you know what? The um, coronavirus vaccine has today made it to Australia. It is being distributed today for the first time. It's according to ABC, Australian Broadcasting. And even so, even so, I know there are people who, perhaps for what they consider good reasons, don't want it, are afraid of it, uh, to the point where there are people who make up all kinds of scary stories of why a vaccine is bad. Lots of reasons. Oh, they'll fill your ear with reasons why a vaccine is bad. I was raised at a time when polio 
was a scourge. Polio was this horrible, infectious disease that would pick out one child in a family or one adult in a family and cripple them for life. Uh, I remember putting people in iron lungs. Those are the words we used. You had to go into a breathing, basically a respirator and be in a wheelchair. Just suddenly you were struck, stricken by the polio virus. When Dr. Jonas Salk invented the polio vaccine, that was my first encounter. I was very impressionable. I was five years old and the word Dr. Jonas Salk, S-A-L-K was on everybody's lips because Dr. Salk's laboratory, I think it was La Jolla, California, invented the polio vaccine. And everyone rushed to get vaccinated because we did not want polio to take our lives away. And we were still alive, but we were crippled. We were, we had a, a lifelong deformity, infirmity that we had to live with. So, there was no doubt that you wanted the polio vaccine. And it was an in injection and then it became oral. You got to take a, take a pill and it was put in a sugar cube. They, I remember that, I, I think I got my polio vac, my sock vaccine from a, they took a dropper and dropped it on a sugar. Hello. Maybe I think Ramon Sure's network is down. So maybe as Ramon Sure gets back online, um, I can just make a few announcements for Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. Ramon Sure is going to introduce very soon his um, lecture, which will be tomorrow night at CDTB, Sunday, about how Buddhism Buddhists can respond to the global pandemic. It's from uh, 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, you can find the link, I think probably at the cdbusa.org website. Let me just go search for it. And um, in addition to that, let me share my screen so then people can follow what I'm doing here. So it'll be on CTTB. Uh, the Zoom link is there on the CTTB website. But if you're interested, please type in the berkeleymonitor.org um, chat box or the, the contact form. We can send it to you. Um, the other things that we can mention are at Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. If you want our upcoming events, let me share my screen. We have uh, upcoming an Amitabha session from February 27th to March 5th, 2021. So that will be starting very soon, next weekend. We'll transmit the eight precepts on Saturday, February, February 27th. So you're very welcome to join that. Um, we'll be reciting both in the at morning and the afternoon. And if you do any of the session with us, you're, um, you can put up some pieways, some plaques wishing for those you care about well-being. So you can find us at berkeleymonastery.org. The other thing that you can join us for after the um, Amitabha session from March 7th to March 14th, we have a retreat on the four boundless hearts. Um, this is kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. And uh, we've been doing this a few times now and it's been quite popular. And so if you really wanna look into what are these four hearts, cause we talk about it a lot, Siddhe Shisa or Metta, Karuna, Mudita and Upeka. Uh, we talk about it all the time, but really do we know what they are? And so if we can really investigate it, we can find that actually these hearts 
help us tap into something that's a place of fearlessness in ourselves. And so we actually titled the, the, this particular, um, they call it a pod, called the Four Fearless Hearts. So you can go here and then you can register. And so um, apply to join on the bottom here, All right? And then we have our regular online schedule. Rev. Hong Shur has his Fridays uh, interfaith and intrafaith lectures at 12.30 p.m. And we also have the Great Compassion Mantra Dedication of Merit from 6.30 to 7.30 a.m. So let me, um, I think we can put the, the, the information for the Zoom call with Rev. Hong Shur uh, tomorrow on, in our chat box. I'll do that in a moment. I think Rev. Hong Shur is back. Hi, Hi, I'm back. Yeah, sorry about that, everybody. I gave a, a, just an update on our BBM events when you were away, Dharma Master. Good you, great, thank you. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, apologies, everybody. We are... Uh, experienced a glitch and we're back. I was mentioning there are folks who uh, despite having the presence of the vaccine for coronavirus are for various reasons not interested in it and I sent telling my story that I grew up um, thinking that absolutely I did want if it was available. Um, and if people have their, their reasons for preferring not to, that's certainly uh, you want to respect people's choice. But we um, want to keep an open mind and learn. I think we lost our master again. Um, so, oh, our master's back. Yeah, not happy. Okay, let's see if we can make this happen. There we go. Okay, Yeti and yes. All right, here's what I want people to watch and listen. Master Hua says, people at Gold Mountain Monastery, people at Gold Mountain Monastery, should pay attention to this. The government has announced a vaccine is available. It's a preventative. I read in the Chinese newspaper, it's about the swine flu. This is Shurfu's commentary, 1976, swine flu, right? <laughs> Everybody should go get vaccinated. Once this illness, once this sickness gets propagated, once it, it's, it's contagious, it's really serious. He says the newspaper talked about Philadelphia. 
uh, where many, many people died in Philadelphia because of swine flu. So San Francisco now has a way to prevent the illness, which is the vaccine. We should all go and get vaccinated. It's good if everybody in the midst of your busy lives go get vaccinated, says Master Hua. So he goes on to say, well, let's talk about uh, blood donors. Bodhisattvas are willing to donate their blood. And here in the assembly today, he says, there's quite a few of us who are willing to donate their blood to living beings. However, he says, is it the case that uh, that bodhisattvas sell their blood? Are they in the business of donating blood for sale, for money? There's no principle in that. That's not the bodhisattva path to make a profit from selling parts of your body's blood. In regard to the, the flu vaccination, it's cultured to go on AIDS. You're taking life to make that vaccination. Are we aware of that? So uh, the translator is repeating a question from somebody in the audience, and he says, there is a rumor that the swine flu, this is 1976, the swine flu vaccine is cultivated on eggs. Is that the case? That's a question. <laughs> The, uh, the translator, so there's a question, there's another translator. She's translating for Shurfu. The question came in English. And she's saying that, did, uh, is it the case that if you are using a vaccine that was cultivated in eggs, are you killing, are you killing, uh, breaking your killing precept by involving eggs? Shrif was asking for clarity, a clarification about how, how vaccines are cultured in eggs. How do they grow it on the eggs? They grow it in the eggs? Yes, it's injected in the eggs. Master Hua's response is, this is for the purpose of curing illness. Uh, even if there is, if it's a fertile egg, if there's life in the egg, it hasn't yet become a chick. It's still uh, prior to that, still in the embryonic stage. This process is done to save people's lives. So we don't necessarily have to consider this as killing, 
the goal is actually to save lives. It's true that there are potential chicks in eggs that they could become living creatures, but they are very small. They have not yet taken form. Um, uh, okay. The situation has its causes and conditions. The essential aim should be to save lives. Saving the potential chicks is a secondary issue. And uh, we might remind people, in this case, both Pfizer and Moderna uh, coronavirus vaccines are not uh, brought into being. They're not cultivated on eggs. The annual flu virus that we've been used to taking in the drugstore, you know, all these years, sometimes those flu viruses, depending on what year it is, what season, are cultivated on eggs. In this case, our coronavirus vaccine is not. All right, there we go. So uh, just provide that for people's reflection as they decide whether or not to get the vaccine. Really good idea, our teacher agrees. We agree with him, in other words. So uh, how many people listening in Chinese today? 71, 170 in the, on YouTube. Thank you all for tuning in. We will soon be with the verses to the 10 stages, the 10 grounds. And uh, Dharma Master Jin Chuan has already told people about the, about the session coming up at Berkeley Monastery, the Amitabha session, chance to write Pai Ways. Uh, We can transfer merit through Medicine Buddha's mantra. Where we transfer merit, transfer merit to our friends in Texas. Um, whole, wholesome, good-hearted people rescued thousands of sea turtles that were freezing. They're just freezing. And I saw some fascinating pictures of alligators who alligators process for survival in temperatures at five degrees, you know, above zero, they allow their bodies to freeze, but they put their snouts through the ice. So the, there are the pictures of alligators with a little hole in the ice about this big and this alligator's nose sticking out so that when they thaw out, they let their bodies go into hibernation and freeze solid. But when they thaw, the, the air will be there. Amazing. Techno technologies among animals for surviving this incredible cold snap. Yeah, yeah. Climate change is real. Let's recite Medicine Buddha's mantra. Transfer it where you wish. Om Namo Bhagavate I Aiduriya Prabharaja Sanyak Sambudaya Adhyatva Vansaje Vansaje Vansaja Sambudate Swaha Bye.
Rajaya Tata Gantaya Arahate Samyak Sambudaya Tata Should we make three bows to the Buddhas? Join me if you wish. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. Thanks, everybody, for joining. See you all next week.